Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your grace. When we consider once again that we are but creatures, totally and completely dependent upon you, and creatures who have offended you at infinite degrees in our natural rebellions and our unbelief, and yet you have looked upon us not with what we deserve, but through the lens of your love and with grace, grace that saves and grace that transforms. And so we are trophies of your kindness, trophies of your love, trophies of your grace, eager to have our hearts laid bare before you even this evening. We ask for your help by your Holy Spirit to use your word with surgical precision to dig down into the recesses of our hearts and the ways that we think. Would you separate out thoughts and intentions, joints and marrow, and accomplish what only you can do by the supernatural work of your spirit and the instrumentality of your word. And give us fresh eyes and soft hearts, pliable wills, in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this evening to Psalm 11. We are making our way through the songbook of Israel. And I trust this has been helpful to you. It certainly has for me. To set up this psalm this evening, I want you to imagine taking the Constitution of the United States and shredding it to bits? What if there were no Bill of Rights? What if eminent domain were the normal and regular law of the land? That is, some government entity decides that it wants your property and says, I can use it better than you can, so it's now mine. What if there was a complete and abject failure of the recognition of all private property? What if taxation was used as confiscation or taxation was used as values enforcement? In other words, we don't like the way that you're living. We don't like how you believe. So we're going to tax you. What if the government misappropriated funds for the personal gain of elected officials? What if there were no checks and balances? What if the three branches of our government had all but ceased to function according to design? There was one just great big monolithic state controlling our lives. What if an increasingly selfish and immoral society made it difficult for people just to trust each other, to trust institutions, or to trust that the right thing will be done? What if the justice system was employed to promote and to protect injustices? What if the very fabric of society were crumbling around us? Where would you turn? Where would you turn for security and safety and well-being? If the solid ground beneath our feet crumbles, what hope is there for living correctly? If no one plays by the rules... How can the godly survive? That is the subject matter for Psalm 11, and I want to turn your attention there, and, and we will read from Israel's songbook here together this evening. For the choir director of David, in Yahweh I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Yahweh tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. May he rain snares upon the wicked. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Psalm 11 is ordered as something of a problem solution song. There's a problem in the beginning and a solution in the end. The turn is in verse 4. Again, as we make our way through the Psalms, we're looking for that turn. The, the, the situation in the Psalm that turns from a problem or a crisis of faith to a confidence of faith. That happens for us here in this Psalm in verse 4. 
There is an ascription at the beginning, that's part of the text, for the choir director of David. Again, a reminder that this is to be housed in the songbook of Israel, directed by a choir director for the congregation to sing. That is, these words are intended by God to be intentionally sung by God's people, a refrain for the heart where God's people would enter into the very situation David was feeling when he penned it, the very situation the Holy Spirit intended for his people to grapple with. And then for the the choir together, the congregation of God's people, to sing the solution. We don't know the exact historical situation that David has in mind. Some have suggested Saul's hostility toward David before David was king. I'm inclined to think that the psalm was written uh, during David's reign. But the psalm seems to indicate some sort of personal threat to David. And the consequences of a personal threat to David amounted to political instability for the nation, with severe consequences for the people. If David, as king, is threatened personally, that is a threat to the nation. And the psalm, as others do, contrasts the activities of the wicked and the righteous. We see the wicked and the righteous described here. Again, these are not absolute statements about some people's sinlessness and other people's sinfulness. These are categorical statements about loyalties. To whom do you belong? Are you in faith, trusting in Yahweh, and therefore living according to his standards? You are called in the Psalms the righteous. You are opposed to Yahweh, living a life of faithlessness. You are described as the wicked. That category is given here in this psalm. Again, a personal crisis for David was a national political crisis for Israel. It also represented a covenantal crisis for the people of God. You see, God had placed promises for the nation in the placeholder of David as king. You remember 2 Samuel 7, God had made his promises were an expansion of, an Ab- of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, which itself was an expansion of the gospel covenant in Genesis 3.15, that God was narrowing the focus of his salvific plan, his redemptive plan for humanity through David and his reign over Israel. And so a threat to David was a, not just a personal crisis for him, but a national political crisis for Israel and a covenantal crisis related to God's redemptive plan for humanity. I want you to see the apex of the psalm from the beginning. It's in verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is the problem. That is the climactic statement of the problem laid out in the first three verses. And you this evening may not be experiencing the effects of societal meltdown. But you can recognize at the front end that any crisis in your life has the ability to expose and refine your faith. When difficulty happens, your faith, the quality of it, the contents of it, the anchorage of it are exposed. They bubble up to the surface. Difficulty has the ability of providing the opportunity for faith to be seen for what it is. And listen, your faith is only as good as its object. So it's an important thing for us in a difficulty to ask, in what am I trusting? A crisis may reveal to you the actual foundation of your faith. Are you trusting in your finances? When a financial crisis hits... That can be exposed. Are you trusting in your own abilities? When you come to the end of your abilities, when your trial exceeds your abilities to match it, your faith can be exposed. Are you trusting in your intelligence or your physical health, your own ingenuity? Or perhaps you are trusting in external forces like the stock market or societal stability or the supply chain or the justice system. When a crisis happens and these things fall apart, think the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 1929, people's faith is exposed. What were you really trusting in? In the housing crisis of 2008 uh, that hit Arizona pretty hard, what were people trusting in? These personal crises provide opportunities 
They provide opportunities, really for the exposure, the refinement of our faith. By way of outline this evening, we'll talk about a situational test of faith. A situational test of faith is the first thing that a personal crisis provides opportunity for. A situational test of faith. We see this in the first three verses. Verse 1 begins, In Yahweh I take refuge. And here the answer to the problem is given in the first verse. David says, I take refuge in Yahweh. And in the Hebrew text, Yahweh is at the front of the sentence. It is emphatic. The very first word we're confronted with in the psalm is Yahweh. That's where David starts. Yahweh affirms at the very beginning where he ends the psalm in faith. But what happens next is the interlude of what I believe are David's counselors. And you have a a quotation really extending from the second half of verse 1 all the way to the end of verse 3. And David introduces these quotes from his counselors by saying, So why do you say to my soul? It's not often that we talk this way. Why are you talking to my soul like this? Why are you talking to my heart this way? This is revealing that whatever these guys are saying to David, it pierces. It cuts to the quick. It goes right to his heart. It hits right at the soul level for David. David has said in verse 1, And Yahweh I take refuge. So why are you saying to me? Why are you saying to my soul? Why are you putting a dagger through my heart. Now let's look at what they say. At the end of verse 1, flee as a bird to your mountain. It seems that David is being encouraged to extricate himself from circumstantial difficulty. You got to get out of here. Flee. But you got to go to exile. You, You have to run to safety. These are David's counselors. These would be like his cabinet secretaries. Their counsel to the king is run. And this presents David with a severe temptation to anxiety. If his closest counselors are telling him, the danger is too real, you need to get out of here, your only safety is in the solution we're presenting to you. The danger is too much. For David's counselors, for his inner circle, his cabinet members, the societal stabilities were crumbling. And they were tempted to commend David to get out of there. And and in all likelihood, if David the king were to flee in exile, he would take his inner circle of counselors with him. And David's response out of the gate is instructive. Begin the beginning of verse 1. I trust Yahweh. So why are you telling me to flee like a bird? Don't speak to my soul like that. David says, don't shake my faith. I need to rest on truth about God. There's a crisis in my life, and your first counsel to me is to flee? To simply adjust my temporal circumstances, to ease my discomfort, and find an earthy solution to ensure my safety? Guys, come on. David's life was tied to the welfare of the nation. So a threat to David was a threat to the nation. And you've seen how secret service operates to some degree. They, they want to shelter whomever they're protecting from threats. They got to get them out of there. And and no matter how much uh, presidents or vice presidents or or, uh, official um, politicians have tried to carry on with their duty, it seems like the Secret Service gets in the way. I just want to go do my job, and you guys hound me everywhere I go. You're always surrounding me. I just want to shake hands and kiss babies, and you guys are getting in the way and telling me no. These are David's counselors here. They know that David's life was tied to the welfare of the nation. They knew that a threat to David was a threat to the well-being of the country. But David recognized something else, that a weakening of his faith would be a crippling blow to the nation as well. He was to lead by example. Now listen, just as a caveat here, we need to understand that there is a time and a place to flee danger. David did it often. 
Recognize that when David went to the cave of Adullam, he is fleeing Saul's murderous attempts on his life. In fact, at the end of Saul's reign, leading up to David taking the throne, David's life was regularly in danger. He did flee. He hid in the mountains. He hid in the caves. He, he flew away like a bird, and at times he even went to the Philistines, sought exile in an enemy nation. There is a time and a place to do that. We see the Apostle Paul, as courageous and brave as he was, take his licks in some cases, and in other cases, be let down out of a window by a basket to flee to another city. Jesus gives the command to tribulation saints in Jerusalem in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, read the book of Daniel and flee, run away. There is a time and a place to escape real and mortal danger. But in this instance, David seems to be aware of the temptation in his own heart that the enticement of a mere practical solution to his immediate problem was tantamount to distrust. We will work our way through some of the Psalms where David is actually singing from a cave that he fled to in the time of mortal danger. But we will see that even when David did fly like a bird to a mountain, his trust was in Yahweh. And those are really remarkable scenes. He's in a cave, Saul is hunting him, and he says, Yahweh is my cave. He's not trusting in the rocks. He's trusting in the rock. Here, David says, I don't want to flee. It means his first response is, I'm going to trust the Lord. It seems his counselor's first impulse is, you got to get out of here. It's possible to do both. You can flee or stay, but in either case, you must trust the Lord. I think David is recognizing that the temptation in this circumstance would have been tantamount to distrust, to simply go with an immediate physical solution to a presenting problem. Look at verse 2. Behold, they say, this is still in the quotes of his counselors, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string. They, the word for bend the bow is a word for tread. It, it is to put heavy pressure on. That is, the, the bow is bent in readiness to fire. They put their arrow on the string. The weapon is loaded. To, to think about this perhaps in modern terms, the assassin, the sniper is in camo. He is well hidden. Notice the end of verse 2, to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. There, there is stealth mode for the sniper and the weapon is loaded and his finger is on the trigger. This is a real and present danger. This was an eminent threat in the minds of the counselors. And David's response is so interesting because it, it reveals the reality of the situation. If that is really what's going on, if there is a, a sniper hiding under cover of darkness and nobody knows where he is and that threat is real and his weapon is loaded and his finger is on the trigger, then how could you possibly be safe? even if you were to go to a mountain, hide in a cave. If somebody is hunting you in such a way, how could anyone truly be safe from such a threat? No mountain cave could protect forever. And when the righteous play by the rules and the wicked don't care about God's opinion, the righteous are at a significant tactical disadvantage. They might have the moral high ground, but they don't have the high ground strategically, militarily. They are exposed to the wiles and the schemes of cheats and miscreants. Guileless oblivion is no match for stealthy, underhanded malevolence. You're the good guy. You're doing it right. You just can't compete with people who are willing to cheat. And you can't protect yourself from the threat of every hypothetical evil. Your safety is not in the rocks. If David's world were tottering on the edge of catastrophe, he knew that he would rather face the danger than deny by unbelief the faithfulness of God. Has God made promises to David? Will God protect? 
God can protect by means of running to the cave of Agilom. There's a time and a place for that. But David is not going to be moved by unfounded fears. To yield to his fears here would be a form of unbelief. Listen, the threat of an unseen assassin was a real and present danger and a real test of faith. I have a friend who served in Iraq. And he tells a story of taking a shower in a canvas tent. And he was in uh, right across the Euphrates River from the base of a group called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They were the bad guys. And, and one day, the, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq member decided to put on some scuba gear and swim across the Euphrates River and attack a SEAL base. Now, the SEALs are experts in all kinds of things. I don't know that that was a smart move. But my friend was in the canvas tent shower, and, and here's a familiar sound, pop, pop, that's AK. That we're, that, that, those aren't our rounds, those are bad guy rounds. What's happening? And then zip, zip, two bullets shot through his canvas shower tent, which was very small. Now, this, this was a godly man who trusted in the sovereignty of God, who knew that the arc of every round out of every firearm was sovereignly governed by a good God. As a husband as a, and as a father, he wanted to get back to his family. And lathered up in the shower, trusting the arc of every bullet, and also knowing that one guy jumping onto a seal base, firing off rounds, was going to be toast pretty soon. He continued his shower. <laughs> a very real threat. A real test of faith. What can the righteous do? Look at verse 3. Here the quote continues. Uh, the counselors continue. They, they are a stumbling block to David's faith. And they say, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is the sound of hopelessness in the presence of a very real presenting problem. An, an earthy problem. Uh, the foundations here are, are likely a reference to the, the governance of society, law and order, the stable bedrock of how society works. The reliable social norms, the expectations that people will do what is right. And in the minds of David's counselors, the very fabric of reliable society was breaking down. And so David needed to flee. What can you do if the foundations crumble? How can an honest person get along in a dishonest world? Got to run away. Got to come up with some other solution. I know that every year the Texas state legislature makes a vote to decide whether or not they will secede from the union. Texas is the only independent republic that has been admitted to the 50 United States. And so as a point of order and procedure, every time they begin a legislative session uh, at the beginning of a, of a term, they vote whether or not to remove themselves from the United States. If they ever were to do such a thing, you, you would know that things were bad in the other 49. How many people would move to Texas? Now, I'm, just, I'm native born. I have rights there somewhere. If everything crumbles and falls apart, what can the righteous possibly do? What, what other solution is there than to flee when society crumbles? That is the stumbling block hypothetical question of David's counselors. It is not the answer of faith. The answer of faith comes in the turn in verse 4. Notice the first word in verse 4, Yahweh. This is going to change our attention. Uh, from, from that which tests our faith, this crisis presents an opportunity for the testing of faith. And we move in the second half of the psalm to the theological reinforcements of faith. We are changing our view. David's counselors are concerned about the foundations crumbling. And the unique and ironic turn of this psalm is we're going to go to the real foundation of faith. 
The foundation of our faith is not in our abilities. The foundation of our faith is not in external comforts. The foundation of our faith is not that society keep working the way that it should. The foundation of our faith is not that the Constitution stay intact and everybody obey it. Those are flimsy foundations. Those are earthy problems, and and the answer is in heaven, and and, and that is where David will direct our attention, is where he started in verse 1, Yahweh's my refuge, Uh, not in the counsel of my counselors to run away from the problem. Yahweh is my refuge. That was true whether David would flee or stay. And that is the theology that David directs us to in the end of the verse. This turn is interesting. When we ask the question, how can an honest person get along in a dishonest world? I'm reminded of my college roommate, uh, grew up in Nairobi, Kenya, and his dad was the director of a mission based there in Nairobi. And when he first went there as a missionary, he tried to get his phone line set up. And and he knew that the only thing it took to get the phone line set up is somebody down at the telephone headquarters, take this cable over here and plug it in over there, and now your phone works. A very simple procedure. But like in many places of the world, to get that done required significant encouragement. By significant encouragement, I mean bribes. And he just had a moral conviction about bribes. He said, if if I pay a bribe, then the guy after me has to pay a bribe too. And I don't don't want to put the next guy through that. Uh, You tell me how much it costs to put the phone in, I'll pay that. Um, But I'm I'm not going to pay you a bunch of extra to get it done on my terms. And so he didn't get his phone line attached. And and that was uh, somewhat of a crippling effect on his ministry. And... It took him an extra few hours to get things done every day because he had to walk down to headquarters of the phone company and ask them once again to connect his phone. And he did this every single day. And he would sit down in in front of the manager and he'd open his Bible and he'd start sharing the gospel with the guy and he'd ask, hey, can I have my phone connected? And the guy would hint and, and, and sort of ask without officially asking for a bribe. And he would just smile and not give a bribe. Say, see you tomorrow. And he did this for months, every day, walking down there and pestering the guy. Until finally the guy was just fed up and plugged his phone in. There, okay, your phone works. There is a way for the righteous to survive in an unrighteous world. There is a way for the guy who follows the rules to get along in a rule-breaking society. The bottom line is this theological reinforcement that comes for us in verse 4. Let's read verses 4 to 7 all together, and then we'll walk through the details. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Yahweh tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, Yahweh's soul hates. He will rain fire and snares upon the wicked. Brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. This is all a litany of theological truth. It it takes us off of the problem on earth to the answer in heaven. And if we've got our eyes on the earth, we will despair, we will be hopeless, or we will turn to earthy solutions. But when we get our eyes up, we exercise faith, we have hope. And this prayer song is exactly that. It is faith. It is a turning to God. When we pray, we recognize that we are at the end of our own resources, and we ought to be there at the beginning of our problems. We recognize that we don't have what it takes. Our resources are inadequate. And how flimsy, really, are my finances? Uh, That's not intended to be a rhetorical personal confession. (laughs) How flimsy are our finances? How flimsy are our abilities? Listen, it, it wouldn't take much for a certain trial, a certain calamity, a certain difficulty to stretch us to the very end of all of our resources. We would see very quickly how flimsy we really are. How flimsy is our intelligence? How flimsy is our physical health? How flimsy is our own ingenuity? How flimsy is a hope on external forces like the stock market or societal stability or the supply chain or the justice system? 
These things can all go away in a blink. And what we need is theology. What we need is theology. And I don't mean abstract, book smarts, nerd stuff. I mean real, practical, personal knowledge and application of that knowledge of who our God is. And that's exactly what unfolds in this psalm. Look at verse 4. The first thing we see, the first bit of theology here is God's present otherness. Here's how David says it. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh is in his holy temple. That is, Yahweh is present. He exists. He is somewhere. And, and where is he? he? He is in his holy temple. This is a reference to God's otherness, his holiness. He, he inhabits the, the heavenlies in perfect otherness. Holiness just means that God is different. He's separate from And that's true of his separation ontologically or in his being from every created thing. It also means he's separated from sin. He's different and he's pure. This is where all the hypotheticals in our lives terminate. We can think about all the future things. What if society crumbles? Then what will we do? Let's see Yahweh in his holy temple. Let's just fix our gaze there. He is different than everything created, and He is present. He exists. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 presents for us another situation of radical political instability. This, This is the end of King Uzziah's reign. He had served for decades. In fact, Most of the people in the time that this occurred had never known any other king than Uzziah. They had only known government stability, and now all of that was up in the air. Isaiah records, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord, Adonai, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. With the hem of his robe, that is the very last stitch on the edge of his robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him. Each of these fiery beings, Seraphim, had six wings, with two covering his face, with two covering feet, and with two flying, evidently hovering above this holy ground, too holy to touch even for these fiery heavenly beings. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of armies. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called out, while the house of God was filling with smoke. And what is it that is rattling the cages of this architecture? It's the thunderous voice of these fiery beings. Uh, They are in all likelihood the the four living beings that show up in the throne room scenes of the book of Revelation. They are so majestic and powerful and frightful and terrifying. If you and I saw them, we would fall down before them in fear. We would be tempted to worship them. And at the mere sound of their voice, the thresholds and the foundations of the temple are shaking. And what is it they are saying? Calling out to one another in antiphonal praise. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. Now keep in mind, these are sinless beings. They're not saying Yahweh is sinless, sinless, sinless. They're saying Yahweh is different, different, different. These beings who have never sinned, will never sin, can never sin, are crying out the fundamental difference of Yahweh. And they are proclaiming the whole earth is full of His glory. This is a remarkable scene. It's centering, it's anchoring for Isaiah. Isaiah himself was living in that time of political turmoil, and he was seeing the corruption of the people of Israel. You can just read Isaiah chapter 1 for all the hypocrisy, 
All the blood on the hands of the leadership and the people of Israel. Isaiah calls out a series of woes against them for all their hypocrisy and rebellion and sin. And then in the presence of the holiness of Yahweh, Isaiah himself falls down and says, Woe is me. The woe there is the calling out of God's rightful uh, judgment against God's people and their rebellion. It's the calling of damnation on the heads of people who are rebelling against God. And here Isaiah says, damnation upon me. I am ruined. And then he confesses his own sin. This is a remarkably helpful scene that gets us to something that David is at here. What are we going to do with society crumbling around us? Put your eyes in the holy temple where Yahweh is. In all of his glory, where the seraphim call out before him, he's holy, holy, holy. And the the best, most righteous, holiest guy on the planet falls down in abject terror over his own sin confessing before the Lord, and then being cleansed by the altar of sacrifice. This is where we need to be. What do we do when the wicked are everywhere lurking about, just shooting at the innocent all the time? Where do we go if the foundations are destroyed and society is falling apart? Is there somewhere to run away? Put your heart where God is, in His holy temple. That is his present otherness. God exists, he's present, and he's holy. That's where we need to put our eyes. The next bit of theology is God's transcendent sovereignty. We see this in the second phrase in verse 4. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. Yahweh's throne, the, the seat of his sovereignty, is beyond. It's in heaven. That is, it's out of the reach of corruption. It's unsullied, unsoiled, untainted. It's unchangeable and solid. And you might be thinking, well, wait a second. My problems are down here. I I don't need God up in his holy temple. I don't need him in his heavenly throne. I need God here and now. When's he going to fix this stuff? The reality is the throne of God in heaven and the presence of God in his holy temple These are the true foundations of everything. God's manifest presence in heaven and his sovereign, meticulous rule over everything that happens in the universe starts in his throne room and emanates out towards everything. If God gets off his throne, if God ceases to be holy, there is no hope for any problem in the world. But as long as God is there, everything's under control. It's funny that David's counselors are concerned that the foundations are destroyed because puny, sinful human beings are doing puny, sinful things to other human beings. (laughs) What does that have to do with the holiness of God in his temple or the foundation of his sovereign rule over the universe? Absolutely nothing. The next bit of theology we see in verse 4 is God's interested omniscience. His interested omniscience. Notice, his eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. This is a way to talk about God seeing everything, knowing everything. He sees, and his vision of things going on is not disinterested. He sees and he cares. His his concern is not a helpless concern either. Yahweh is omniscient. And David says his eyelids test. Oh, what does that mean? Think about when you're, you're squinting and concentrating on something. You're trying to narrow your focus. And without you even thinking about it, your eyelids just go smaller because you're really trying to focus in on something. That's the idea here. Yahweh has a, 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 an interested search into the things of man. And so what could the wicked possibly do that escapes God's notice? He sees it all. Next in verse 5, we see Yahweh's discerning judgment. The New American Standard Bible reads this way, Yahweh tests the righteous and the wicked. 
I believe that's the right way to read this. Uh, Yahweh has the wicked in his hands and the righteous in his hands, those categories of people that either trust him or don't, and he tests them. And the word for tests here is a, the word that's used for the refining of metals. And you know the, the way that metals are refined, they are heated up by fire, and impurities rise to the surface. Those impurities are scraped off, and you have a purer metal than before the fire hit it. The, the fiery examination not only proves the purity of the metal, but also produces a proven purity in the metal. It is a refining work. That is the word that's used to describe Yahweh's testing of the wicked and the righteous. Now just think about that. When things come into your life, others have said, well, the, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. There's a, a heat of some trial, some difficulty that comes into a life. What is the result of it in your life? It actually refines a soft heart. And it may prove a hardened heart. This is the effect of the personal crisis. Exposing and, and refining faith by demonstrating not only the theological content of our faith, the object of our faith, Yahweh, or our own resources, but also in the process, God is about refining our faith. The next bit of theological truth here is in the second half of verse 5, and it is personal justice. The one who loves violence, Yahweh's soul hates the one who loves violence, Yahweh's soul hates. This is similar to what we looked at in Psalm 5.5. 5. It is not just that God hates the evil doings, but at his very soul, he hates the evil doer. He is personally opposed in a relational way to those who are about violence and wickedness, especially against his people. And there's a tremendous comfort for believers in this, Spurgeon said it this way, if God hates the wicked, why should I fear him? If God hates the wicked, why should I fear him? And then Spurgeon goes on to compare the situation to Haman. You remember Haman had it out for the Jews. And, and as long as the king was in agreement with Haman's plan, Haman was riding high. But what happened when the king understood what was in Haman's heart? Haman went to his own gallows. He was powerless against the king because all of a sudden the king's power was turned against him. Spurgeon's point is simply this. If God hates the wicked, don't be afraid of him. There is a day coming when God will execute justice. He will execute, execute vengeance on behalf of his people. And you and I need not fear those who are opposed because they're opposed to him. It's, it's a vertical situation. Then we see next, theologically, eternal retribution in verse 6. And the text can either read, he will rain snares upon the wicked, or may he rain snares upon the wicked. It's either a, a recognition of what God will do, or a request that he will do it, either way. These snares are traps. God would lay traps so that the wicked cannot escape his justice. And then you have listed fire and brimstone and burning wind. Fire and brimstone is a, a familiar refrain used of eternal judgment. It, it harkens back to a historical event. It's, it's added alongside this idea of a burning wind. Uh, a burning windstorm is common in the Arabian deserts. It's called a simum. That is a, a deadly desert storm blowing hot and laden with sand, it, it tears apart buildings and, and clothing and, and is even lethal. The fire and brimstone, of course, raining down from heaven reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's the record of that account in Genesis 19.24. Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. This was a real historical event with a scar left on the earth, with scars on the memories of humanity. It seems like everybody knows about Sodom and Gomorrah. They become the, the picture, 
the typological picture of God's judgment. They even become typological of the kind of judgment God will bring about in the eternal state for those who don't believe the gospel. Listen to Jude 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. The Bible looks back on Sodom and Gomorrah as a picture of what will take place when God executes his holy vengeance. In fact, uh, you can see the monument to the moral catastrophe of Sodom and Gomorrah and the monument to God's dealings with it on Google Earth to this day. It stands as a a record in history pointing backwards and pointing forwards. And all of this leads to the last bit of theology here in verse 7. It is consistent character. Consistent character. We have that explanation that sort of bundles up all of this together. David sings, for Yahweh is righteous. And I think there's an implied therefore. Therefore, he loves righteousness. Yahweh is righteous. It is in keeping with his character to do what is right. Therefore, Yahweh loves righteousness. It would be inconsistent with his character for him to do otherwise. The only way that Yahweh maintains his reputation as being good and right and just is to actually do good and righteousness and justice and to love what is good and right and just. If that chain is broken between who he is and what he does and what he loves, then he loses his own reputation. His consistent character is a matter of of hope and confidence for believers. Because believers, though not being righteous, have taken refuge in the righteousness provided by Yahweh. This is the great conundrum that people that don't understand the message of the Bible, they they just miss. You may have heard the criticism, oh, all you Christians are hypocrites. You you, you preach against sin, but but you yourselves sin. And we just say, well, yes. (laughs) We preach against sin, and, and yes, we sin. We were slaves to sin. We're slaves no longer. We, we loved our sin. We, we don't love our sin that way anymore. We're, we're new creatures. We've been bought with a price and our lives are not our own. And the penalty of sin for us has been removed by the grace and the gospel. The power of sin over us has been removed by our removal from slavery. And though sin is still present in us, even that one day will be removed. Our fundamental relationship to sin has been changed. And so... Yes, we we talk about the fundamental problem of humanity, not because we're not guilty, but because our guilt has been forgiven. And here's the great reality of the gospel. Yahweh is righteous and he will not budge his standard. And yet Yahweh provides righteousness as a gift through faith for all who will take refuge in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on a cross to make a fantastic exchange, really an unbelievable exchange. My sin for his righteousness. I get clothed in his perfection and he got wrapped up in the garments of my wickedness so that God could grant me what Jesus deserved while he gave to Jesus what I deserved. It's a remarkable substitution It's the good news. It's the gospel. It's the only way anybody gets to heaven because it's the only way they get their sins forgiven because it's the only way God could forgive sins and maintain his reputation as just and righteous. It's the only way this verse is upheld. Yahweh is righteous. Therefore, he loves righteousness. And look at the last phrase. The upright will behold his face. Those who are in the category of the upright, again, not by their own merits, but simply by the faith of taking refuge in God's provision of righteousness as a gift. They get to see him. And you know the difference between the wicked and the righteous in the end? Everybody will be before God. Everybody will come into his manifest presence. The question is, will it be enjoyable? 
You see, the righteous by faith will enter God's presence. They will have been perfected and fit for eternity in a way that they can come into God's presence and not be incinerated by it. They can come into the very presence of His glory, the outshining radiance of the sum total of His attributes, and not be blown away in judgment, but actually stand blameless with great joy. The wicked, on the other hand, will come into that glorious, outshining radiance, still holding on to the filthy rags of the sins they would not turn from. And they will face eternal consequences for that sin. The presence of God for them will not be a joy, but eternal doom. If you're here tonight and, and you want to know, how can, how can you get on, on David's heart here? How can you learn to trust God in the midst of troubling circumstances? How can your personal crises actually reveal a robust faith rather than expose a faithlessness or a faith in futile things? If you want to know what it means to love God, to have life, to know Jesus, just talk to somebody around you. Lots of people here this evening know how to get eternal life because they as sinners have gone to Jesus for refuge. Don't leave without securing these things before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this psalm, uh, for what it holds out for us, a confident hope in your sovereign goodness. We pray that we would not be tripped up by earthy solutions to earthy problems. We need heaven solutions. We pray that you'd give us enduring faith to look to you at all times. In Jesus' name, amen.